Hello everyone, my name is Xiao Zhu, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Michigan. In this video, I will talk about MPBound, an efficient network-level collaboration system for mobile devices. Hope you will enjoy it. Mobile devices are everywhere. We use it at home, at work, indoors, and outdoors. Many people today possess more than one personal device, such as multiple smartphones, or smartphones compiled by smartwatches and tablets. I bet you are missing group activities a lot recently. When people gather together, their mobile devices do as well. This ubiquity of mobile devices creates abundant opportunities for better utilizing available network resources. For instance, one device can assist another with downloading data over cellular. This leads to a much higher throughput compared to using a single UE. Wi-Fi networks offered by public places, such as hotels, often impose per-device rate limit. Such a limit can be naturally overcome by multi-device collaboration, since each participating device has its own Wi-Fi interface. In addition, wearables can be placed at a spot with good signal and act as Wi-Fi or LTE range extenders. When running low on battery, a smartphone can also offload power-hungry LTE access to a smartwatch paired over an energy-efficient Bluetooth or Wi-Fi link. These benefits definitely motivate us to build a collaboration framework to make full use of the wireless resources. By closely examining these use cases, we notice that all of them can be realized under the multipath transport paradigm where user data can be distributed over multiple subflows or network paths. Unlike traditional multipaths such as MPTCP, we need to support distributed multipaths, where subflows traverse different devices. Specifically, such a distributed multipath transport system involves one primary device, where the client app runs, and the multiple helper devices, which boost the primary network performance. Data is downloaded over multiple remote paths and the primary merges all the received paths before delivering the whole content to the client app. Well, this may sound intuitive. However, we face numerous challenges when designing and implementing such a system. For example, how to properly manage heterogeneous devices and local wireless links, how to strategically leverage the proper devices to improve the network performance, how to design a robust multipath scheduler that considers both remote paths and local paths, with the latter being unique in our problem setting, how to expose appropriate interfaces to users and applications, as well as how to make the system transparent to client and server applications. Existing network level collaborations suffer from several limitations. A desired network level collaboration must be flexible to support different types of apps and require minimal changes to the mobile and network infrastructure. Solutions that rely on Tethering plus MPTCP have been proposed. However, a Tethered device performs as a simple layer 3 rotor, making it difficult to flexibly support various enhancements and policies at layer 4 and 5. There are also inverse multiplexing solutions which incur significant deployment overhead. Another line of solutions require modifications to the applications at layer 5. Some of them are designed solely for a particular type of apps. Performance is another concern. For example, in Tethering, the effective data rate is always the minimum of the remote and local link bandwidth. Application layer-based solutions rely on HTTP byte range requests, which incur network idle periods between requests on the same path. The scheduling decisions of existing solutions are also not optimal. Suboptimal performance usually leads to excessive energy consumption. Even if the network condition is stable, in the tethering approach, the congestion control is end to end, so the faster wireless link will be running at the speed of the slower wireless link, causing prolonged remote or local link radio on time, which leads to increased energy consumption. 
NetWorkID operators incurred by HTTP batch requests also waste energy. To bridge this gap, we propose MPBound, a distributed multipath transport system for efficient network level collaboration. It involves two types of devices, one primary and one or more hyper devices connected with non-lived TCP connections called PIPs. The client application, such as a file downloader or a video player, only runs on the primary. Traffic from the app is transparently intercepted by the MPBound service and scheduled to transmit either over the primary's own interface, the PS path, or through helpers with forwarding over the HS path. To be fully transparent to internet servers, the system can introduce a proxy which has MP bound from remote servers by establishing single path connections with them. We next elaborate how we address the aforementioned challenges for an efficient collaboration framework by detailing the key design choices of MP bound. Let's start with managing subflows. A possible way to establish PEPs is to test the primary to a helper, which acts as a Wi-Fi AP. This approach has two limitations, though. First, some weak helpers, such as smartwatches, may not provide the hotspot mode. Second, since typically the primary can associate with only one Wi-Fi AP, so to support multiple helpers, the tethered helper has to forward traffic for other helpers, leading to extra latency and bandwidth usage. To overcome these limitations, we propose to perform tethering in the opposite way. By activating the primary AP mode and let the helpers collect to the primary. This naturally supports multiple helpers while minimizing the helper primary hope count to one. The overall handshake procedure in MP bound follows that in MPTCP with additional control messages over pipes to coordinate with the helpers. Specifically, the primary sends an init MP join message with the necessary client and server information to the helper, allowing it to establish the second subflow through an MP join message. When the subflow is established, an MP join OK message is returned to the primary as an acknowledgement. The remote and local wireless links exhibit vastly different link characteristics. TCP splitting can effectively improve the performance in such a scenario by shortening the TCP congestion control loop. More importantly, it allows buffers to be set up between the two flows. Such buffers effectively mitigate the negative performance impact caused by the bottleneck shift on a subflow. To illustrate this, consider this simple example, where the pipeline width increases due to the helper device being moved closer to the primary, causing the PEPS throughput becomes higher than that of the HS pass. If there is a buffer at the helper, the buffer data can be transmitted at the PEPS throughput instead of at the throughput of the HS pass when there is no buffer, leading to a shorter data transfer time. Although TCP splitting is not a new idea, we take this concept one step further by placing the split point on a mobile device facing two wireless links in the context of both pass transport. As a critical component of a multipath transport system, a scheduler determines how to distribute the traffic onto multiple paths. Simultaneous subflow completion is a necessary condition for achieving the optimal download time. This is because in case where a subflow finishes earlier than the other one. The fast subflow can always assist the slower one, leading to an even reduced download time. MRTT is the default scheduler of MPTCP, which selects the path with available space in congest window and the minimum RTT. We first demonstrated the performance issue of directly applying MRTT to MP bound. We run a simple experiment where the primary establishes two subflows to a nearby server. The primary downloads from the server a file using MPBound configured with MinRDT. The figure shows the download progress, and we can see that the two subflows do not complete at the same time. 
The unbalanced subflow completion is due to the fact that the scheduler, which runs at the server, only monitors the PS path and the HS path and is unaware of the TCP splitting and the downstream pipe. In this particular experiment, since the pipe bandwidth is lower than the HS path, downlink data will be buffered at the helper and drained slowly over the pipe, leading to highly unbalanced subflow completion time. A possible way of achieving simultaneous subflow completion is to modify the subflow availability condition so that a helper subflow is considered to be available when the congestion window of both the HS pass and the pipe have available space. However, by requiring an available congestion window space for the pipe, this approach loses the capability of buffering at the helper, a key feature that MPBound should provide. Therefore, one main challenge that MPBound should address is to enable buffering at the helper while achieving simultaneous subflow completion. To this end, we propose PAMS, a pipe-aware multipass scheduler that explicitly considers the implication of buffering when making data distribution decisions. Although PAMS is originally designed for MPBound, it also applies to general cases where multipass transport meets TCP connection speed. PAMS is built upon a key concept called pipe-aware DNA, which is a mathematical model we introduce to estimate the time it takes for a packet scheduled over a given subflow at a given time to arrive at the receiver under the given network conditions for different remote and local links, such as the throughput and one-way DNA, as well as the buffer level at the server and the helpers. Let's now do some simple math to see how the pipe-aware delay or pad can be derived. For the direct subflow of the primary's own pass, it can be calculated by adding the PS pass one-way delay and the buffering time at the sender. The buffering time can be calculated by dividing the sender buffer level by the PS pass throughput. For an indirect subflow, since are a little bit more complicated, and we have two wireless links and helper set buffering. For a packet scheduler on an indirect subflow, it first needs to go through the sender buffer on the server, which takes time t, calculated by dividing the sender buffer level by the HS pass throughput. After this time, the helper buffer may still contain some buffered bytes if it's originally high. Otherwise, it may become empty too, and the helper buffer further leads some time to drain. By summing up the above parts, we can calculate the PAD for indirect subflows as well. PAD gives us an estimate of the end-to-end -end packet DNA of a subflow in MP bound. So how do we leverage it to make scheduling decisions? A possible approach is to modify MinRDT into MinPad, which selects the subflow with the minimum pad as long as the subflow has congestion window space. Although this approach all performs MinRTT, it still tries to occupy all the HS path congestion window space, thus may schedule more data than the subflow's actual capacity. Pad can actually be further improved. Let us consider two cases that require different scheduling strategies. First, when the server has a large amount of remaining data in the buffer to send. It is important to improve the overall bandwidth utilization by keeping all the subflows busy. In this case, pumps applies min pad. The second case is that when there is only a small amount of remaining data, ensuring no latency delivery at the simultaneous subflow completion time is more important than maximizing the throughput. In this case, even when there is an idle subflow, pumps may skip it, namely deferring the scheduling when there are busy subflows that can shorten the delivery latency. Pumps also performs reinjection, which is a mechanism in multipass transport where data that has already been scheduled over one subflow is reinjected into another subflow. This may occur, for example, when a subflow experiences unexpected performance drop or failure, or another subflow's capacity suddenly increases. 
Okay, math time's up, and here's the last piece of our design. Pbound provides interfaces to both mobile users and app developers. First, it has a built-in console on the primary. This allows users to grant apps permission to use MPBound, monitor the runtime status, and configure various policies. In addition, MPBound exposes IPS, allowing third-party apps to programmatically use its service. However, these are only optional APIs that provide more fine-grained manipulation and detailed monitoring of MPBound, which as a transparent service requires no modifications to the apps. MPBound also allows a device to have dual roles of both a primary and a helper, and multiple primary devices may coexist. We call this dual mode, which enables the collaborating devices to better utilize their collective bandwidth, in particular when the primary devices generate traffic at different times. We extensively evaluate MPBound on the various network and device settings by quantitatively comparing it with cables and combine. The two major state-of-the-art solutions we have seen earlier, on network performance, energy consumption, and application QE using commodity smartphones and smartwatches over real LTE and Wi-Fi networks. We start with showing the performance and energy efficiency of MPBound on stable network conditions. The workload is downloading files with different sizes. We vary the number of mobile devices from one to three and measure the download time and energy consumption. We also study MPBound Naive, another variant of MPBound where the default MRTD scheduler instead of pumps is used. As shown, MPBound improves the download time and energy efficiency compared to cables and combine. These improvements are attributed to multiple design choices of MPBound, including the system and pipe realization and layer 4, the hyperside connection split, as well as the pumps scheduler. We next look at some numbers on the changing network conditions. We focus on the two device case. The left figure shows the download time of different schemes where we play the real remote and local wireless bandwidth profiles we collected. The corresponding energy consumption is shown in the middle figure. This again shows that leveraging hyperset connection split, buffer management, and the judiciously designed pumps scheduler helps map bound to achieve high level utilization on the fluctuating network conditions. We also showcase the benefits of MP1 through in the wild experiments, as shown in the red figure. We finally examine how MP1 helps improve the QE and energy efficiency of video streaming, one of the applications that dominate mobile network traffic. We stream adaptive bitrate videos using XO Player to study the impact of different schemes on video bitrate. We use three different settings covering both animations and science fiction movies. Compared to cables with the same number of devices, MPBound reduces the energy consumption. With three devices, MPBound further improves the video bitrate in two of the three settings compared to cables, which could not utilize the extra device due to its architectural limitation. More evaluation results as well as design details can be found in our paper. Thank you for watching our video and I'm happy to answer questions.